Investing can be hard. Really, really hard. So hard, in fact, that it's become the general consensus that the best strategy for most investors is to simply ignore all of the noise, buy into a general stock market index fund, and leave it at that. Because so few people manage to beat the market consistently over an extended period of time. There's so much information out there to parse through, and so, so many contradictions between what the information suggests an investor should do to profit from a trade and what they actually do. Today, we're going to be talking about eight common investing biases that lead to those contradictions, and what we can do as investors to ensure that we don't fall prey to the worst consequences of having these investing biases. Whether we decide to stick with the consensus opinion and just buy the market, or whether we decide to take a more active approach to our investments. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a 30-day free trial of Audible and two free audiobooks of your choice, as well as a list of some books on money I'd recommend checking out with your free trial. The first biases I want to go over today are anchoring and confirmation bias. Anchoring isn't really a bias per se, it's more of a cognitive quirk that we all have, but it's the tendency for an investor to put too much emphasis on initial pieces of information in order to make future decisions, which can lead to inaccurate valuations, projections, and even holding investments that are falling too long in the hopes of a rebound to the purchase price, which in this case would be the anchor. Confirmation bias is a tendency to seek out information that supports what we already believe, and ignore information that contradicts those beliefs. This can lead to a number of undesirable scenarios, such as as George hearing a rumor of a potential bankruptcy at one of the companies he's investing in. He goes online and searches for stories and articles discussing the bankruptcy, which further cements his belief in the possibility of a bankruptcy coming and causes him to sell the stock. Many other investors did the same thing, causing the price of the company's shares to drop. But it turns out that the rumor was wrong, and actually the big announcement was of a new product launch. George buys back in, but does so at a higher price than what he previously sold for. Confirmation bias can also lead to things like buying into ongoing bubbles, or failing to buy into an ongoing dip, and also missing out on opportunities in other sectors, markets, or assets due to hyper-focusing on one type of investment because they believe it is the best. Confirmation bias can be managed in a couple of ways. First, by actively seeking out contrary points of view to broaden your horizon, and second, by asking disconfirming questions, such as what's wrong with this idea or point of view, or why won't this strategy work. Another common perception bias is hindsight bias, which leads an investor to believe, after the fact, that the run-up or fall of some investment was totally predictable and completely obvious beforehand, whereas in reality, it couldn't have been reasonably predicted. Financial bubbles are always subject to substantial hindsight bias after they burst. Following the dot-com crash and the Great Recession, many pundits and analysts were able to demonstrate quite clearly how events that seemed trivial at the time were actually signs of future financial troubles. They were right, but what's often left out in those stories is that there were also other events which reinforced the assumption that the boom time Times would continue, at least for a little while longer. This focus means that hindsight bias can lead us to becoming too overconfident in our own, or others, ability to predict the future market movements. After all, since we all know exactly why prior movements happened, and maybe even correctly predicted one or two of them before, why wouldn't we be able to spot the pattern before it happens next time? This kind of attitude could lead to mistimed trades and overuse of leverage at inopportune times, among other things. Thankfully, correcting for hindsight bias is pretty straightforward. We just need to remember that we don't have a crystal ball. So let's not act as if we do. A third common investing bias is loss aversion, which refers to the phenomenon that we feel losses, perceived or real, more strongly than equivalent gains. This can lead to several behaviors like not wanting to invest in the markets due to the volatility, again, a loss on paper can still feel bad even if it's not technically a real loss, choosing more conservative investment strategies than we rationally should because we're trying to avoid those temporary losses more than we're trying to achieve strong long-term gains, or, ironically, holding on to winning and losing investments too long, as there are some studies that have found that many investors don't consider an investment a loss until it is realized, which Makes sense, because until that point, it's only a loss on paper. But because of that, they may refuse to sell a losing investment until well after it's become clear that it is, in fact, a losing investment. And as a result, they take an even greater loss than they would have otherwise. On the flip side, some investors will sell investments at a small gain in order to ensure that they realize some sort of a gain from it, even if a rational examination of the investment would suggest that it still has more gas left in the tank. In that case, the investor doesn't recognize a loss on paper, but 
they also don't recognize as large of a gain as they probably should have, which, in its own way, is a form of loss. In order to overcome it, you can establish clear exit points for your investments, on both the gain and loss side. A common way of doing this on the loss side is using a stop loss order. This should be done before you pull the trigger on a trade. Another thing that you can do is to recontextualize what risk really is to you. In the investing community, risk is often defined by short-term volatility, as measured by an investment's standard deviation of returns. But you don't have to look at it that way. Another way to define investment risk is the potential for an irreversible negative outcome. This broader definition allows you to cover a wider variety of scenarios, because at the end of the day, the risk of not achieving high enough returns to build a nest egg for retirement is just as real as the risk of an investment falling by 20% from previous highs one year. It's just that the first is much more likely to be experienced while holding government bonds or some other low return asset, while the latter is more likely to happen when investing in stocks. Moving right along, because we tend to feel losses more strongly than gains, and because we tend to put too much emphasis on early information to make future decisions, we can run into another bias known as disposition effect bias. This bias refers to our tendency to put labels on our investments, or anything, really, such as winners and losers. We tend to behave as if the label was gospel. Put another way, an investment that we've labeled as a winner is one that we're going to continue to hold on to, even if a more rational examination of it would suggest that there's likely little growth potential left, and we should sell it. The same can be true of losers. If we label something as a losing investment, we're more more likely to cut ties with it regardless of what a truly unbiased analysis would suggest. After all, it's difficult to admit to ourselves when we're wrong because, well, being wrong sucks, so we often ignore the facts that are staring us right in the face until those facts become so overwhelmingly one-sided that we have no choice but to act. This delay can, and often does, eat into our long-term returns. Similar to loss aversion, you can establish clear exit points on both the gain and loss side of an investment so as to avoid making, or delaying, any major investment decisions. The fifth bias that I want to go over today is familiarity bias. Familiarity bias is our tendency to overly favor things that we're familiar with. In the investing world, this can take the form of investing a much larger portion of your money than a truly unbiased analysis would suggest you should into things like stock of a company you work for, a market market that you're familiar with, or even your own country. For instance, you might stick to investing only in stocks or baseball cards because you aren't familiar enough with the bond market or commodities to put your money into them. Now, admittedly, this isn't always a bad thing. I mean, you probably shouldn't be investing in things that you aren't comfortable with or don't understand. And if the investments in your market pay off, such as those who have been investing in the US stock market for the last several decades, you can still find quite a lot of success. Where this bias can become potentially dangerous is when you are not giving other investment opportunities an honest look to see if they'd be right for you and your goals, or just help you better diversify your current investments. After all, not every country's market manages to maintain strong growth figures for extended periods of time. Just look at Japan's stock market since the 1990s. Thankfully, familiarity bias can be managed by broadening your horizons through education and setting up checks and balances for yourself. This usually takes the form of talking to a friend, colleague, or financial advisor regularly as a sounding board to better ensure that your reasoning is sound, you're considering all your options, and you're not making any major mistakes. In other words, leaving no stone unturned. A sixth investing bias that can be particularly devastating is self-attribution bias. Self-attribution bias is our tendency to take credit ourselves when things go right and blame external factors when they don't. Obviously, this can lead to some nasty outcomes. One is that we can become overconfident, if not outright delusional, about our own investing abilities, and we've already discussed why that can be bad. Another is that we can get stuck in a self-defeating loop, believing that our winning strategy will deliver us the results we're looking for despite all evidence to the contrary following several successes of failures. However, since we believe that those failures are the result of external circumstances, as opposed to our own strategy just not being as good as we thought it was originally, we're far less likely to adapt our approach and actually find the success that we're looking for, especially if there are a couple of minor successes sprinkled in there from time to time. This bias can be particularly nasty for do-it-yourself investors. Given their DIY approach, there's a couple of things that make this bias potentially so devastating. First, a fair number of them don't utilize a financial advisor, or have any other checks and balances around them, such as other people in the investing community who are willing to let them know when they're moving towards the edge. Second, because of this, every decision or strategy that they make is theirs alone. This can lead to them feeling a little bit more emotionally invested in seeing their plans succeed than other investors. Remember disposition effect bias, which can make it more difficult for them to admit defeat and cut their losses when they should. Overcoming this bias takes a combination of instituting checks and balances into your investing approach, having clearly defined exit points on your investments, continually learning more about investing and reality testing your assumptions, and a healthy dose of self-awareness. Again, we don't have a crystal ball, so not all of our investments are going to pan out the way we thought. That's okay. 
Trend chasing or recency bias is next on our list, and it refers to our tendency to put a greater emphasis on recent performance or other recent information when making our financial decisions than we probably should. This is a surprisingly strong and common trading bias. Just to give you an idea of how common it is, take a look at this image. This image shows the net cash flows of mutual funds based on where those mutual funds ranked in terms of performance for the previous year. You'll notice that in most years, the funds who ranked in the top 20 or 30% of the previous year tended to get the vast majority of net cash inflows. In fact, in a couple of years, it looked like they got basically all of the inflows, with the worst performers seeing the largest outflows. Which obviously makes intuitive sense, as investors want to be invested in the funds that make them the most money, but they seem to be making those decisions based, at least in part, on very recent performance metrics, as opposed to other, longer-term considerations. And remember, past performance is not always indicative of future results. So even though Mutual Fund A grew by 22% last year and Mutual Fund B only grew by 15%, it doesn't mean that Mutual Fund A will have better returns going forward. In fact, if Mutual Fund A severely outperformed its usual results in the prior year, it's entirely possible that it'll revert to the mean in the near future, shortly after these investors have made the move to buy in. And if you're constantly jumping in and out of these types of investments, buying high and selling low, it can seriously eat into your long-term returns. How do we overcome this tendency? Well, it's pretty simple. First, recognize that if you're hearing about a trend on the news, in most cases, you're probably already too late to get an outsized benefit from jumping into it. Second, and probably even more importantly, create a financial plan that you're comfortable with and you can stick to. It may not have the same rush appeal that trend chasing does, but it's also far more likely to allow you to achieve your financial goals. And if you really want that kind of rush, there's a ton of other ways to get it without throwing away your financial future. I mean, a lot of people just invest some of their fund money in that kind of a way. The last bias I want to go over today is worry. Worry is a completely natural thing that we all do from time to time, and worrying about your investments is not necessarily even a bad thing. In moderation, it can help ensure that we do our due diligence before making investment decisions. It can also make you more likely to incorporate checks and balances into your system, which can help mitigate some of the biases we've covered today. But when worry becomes so intense that it begins to cloud your judgment, then it can become a problem, because at that point it becomes very hard to be rational and keep things in perspective. And if you can't do those things, then all bets are off. In extreme cases, you could change up your entire asset allocation, sell out of your investments when they've crashed, or even liquidate your entire nest egg altogether, never to invest again. With that in mind, how can we ensure that we never get so worried about our investments that it becomes damaging? In my opinion, it comes down to a few things. First is to be honest with yourself. You need to be aware of who you are and how you're likely to react to certain events like market downturns. You also need to know what you're actually investing for in order to choose investments that are likely the right ones for you. Not everybody needs to have an all-stock portfolio. Sure, the long-term returns have been great historically, but not everybody needs all that. You may well be better off with an allocation that gets 80 or 90% of those returns, but with a significantly higher return floor. Second, do your research up front. Creating a financial plan for yourself and learning about your investments and their history to understand what is and is not normal can make those turbulent times more manageable when they do inevitably come. This process can also lead you to discovering other tactics that you can employ to lower the chances of experiencing the situations that cause you worry excessively in the first place as well as make the most out of a whole host of other situations. Third, create checks and balances in your financial system. Not only does it help mitigate some of the worst effects of the other investing biases we've talked about today, but it also gives you a lifeline to help pull you back from the edge, assuming you're willing and able to hear it. And fourth, brainstorm. Tim Ferriss has a process for dealing with worry that he calls fear setting, that I think can work really well here. Here's the gist of how it works. First, ask yourself, what does my investing horror scenario actually look like? Define your nightmare the worst possible outcome if the scenario that you're fearing came to pass. Think about it in detail and write it down. Then ask and answer for yourself the following questions. 1. What would be the permanent negative impacts that this scenario would have on my life on a scale of 1 to 10? 2. Are these impacts really permanent, or is there something I could do to recover from them and get back on track? Perhaps if the scenario is a major market crash right after retiring, you could take up some part-time work, temporarily, to make ends meet until such time that your investments recover. 3. How likely is it that these negative events actually happen? 4. Is there anything I can do to lower the chances of these negative events from happening, perhaps by altering our asset allocation or utilizing some other techniques like financial guardrails or cash buffers? 5. Is there anything I can do to lower the severity of the negative impact, perhaps by experimenting with ways to live well on less, so a temporary drop in income is more manageable? 6. On a scale of 1 to 10, what are the benefits and drawbacks, both temporary and permanent, internal and external, of the most likely outcome of my plan? In this case, deciding to retire because not every retirement is followed by an immediate market crash. 
7. How likely is it that you could produce at least a moderately good outcome? Assuming you utilized all the tools at your disposal that you had thought of in the above questions. Finally, 8. What is the cost of not going through with your plan, whether physically, mentally, emotionally, or financially? I like this process because it really helps to put things in perspective, again, recontextualizing what risk means to you. Oftentimes, once you've gone through this process, you realize that the thing you were worried about actually wasn't as bad as you thought. And even if it is still something that's rightly to be worried about, at least now you have a plan of action that you can follow to put yourself in the best possible position to succeed. So those are eight common investing biases that we can all fall prey to if we're not careful, as well as a few tips on how to avoid experiencing their most damaging effects. Have you ever experienced any of these biases? How did you overcome them? Are there any biases that you think I've missed? Let me know in the comments section below. And before I go, I want to give a huge thank you to George Cow, whose generous support over on Patreon is helping to keep this channel in the black. Thank you, George, for helping to support the continued creation of these videos. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.